All right, so last week we discussed pretty much the basic parts of an SQL statement, which included, you know, selecting one or all one or more columns or all the columns, uh, basic, you know, where clauses and how those work. Um, this week we're going to talk about aggregate functions. It's actually a pretty short lecture, uh, specifically because I'll be also talking about the second assignment right after. Um, so you will have all the bits and pieces you need, uh, almost. All right, so aggregate functions are functions in SQL that allows you to summarize data. Um, there's many, many aggregate functions, and depending on which database engine you are using, sometimes you'll have more than others. However, uh, the ones up on the screen currently are the most common ones that people use. Um, they usually operate on a group of records coming back. Uh, normally, you know, the whole table. So the common ones we see are count. Count's actually one of the most used ones you will see. Um, it allows you to count the number of rows in a table, especially if you do count star, because that counts everything that's being returned, every single row being returned, regardless. Um, you can count the values of a specific column, and it will count any values that are not null, which is, you know, because you can't count null because null is absence of value, so you can't count something that doesn't exist. Um, actually, there's one other little derivative on count, which I'll show you guys in a moment. Um, then there's sum, which basically adds up the columns. Average, min, and max. So the average calculates the average, so you don't need to figure it out. Um, minimum value or maximum value, which is really handy to figure out, you know, uh, the smallest values or the biggest values. Hey, Well, you can do an average between values, yes, by supplying the range in the where clause. Uh, if you want a range of values after they've been averaged, I'll talk about that closer to the end of the lecture, because there is a way to do that too. So here's a sample of an aggregate function that is at its absolute most basic. Um, some that's it. You just add it up. Uh, I'll actually demo it because it'll make. I mean, that's literally it. I mean, there's not there's not a lot to say to it, right? You go select some line total from. I wish my SQL would remember my font size from uh, order lines. And if I run that, and of course I don't have that column there because it's just total. And go. It returns one value. It basically took the total and added them up. I could also instead run the average. What is the average line total? And now it gives me, it basically takes all the values, adds them up, and divides them by the number of rows that are being counted. You could theoretically do it yourself if you really wanted to. No, the nulls are not gonna be included in average, min, max, because they are not values. It's absent of value, so you can't opt do math on a null. One plus null equals null. Oh, really, that's how SQL treats it. So you try to do anything with a null, the ending result will be a null. The null eats other values. Pardon? Yep, yeah, well, I was going to about show that uh, count star. And now we've got the count of rows. And if I really wanted to get fancy, I could go sum total divided by the count of star. And it gives the same thing. So for those of you that haven't learned about business math, that last one is a piece of business math. <laughs> Take the total, add them up, divide it by number of rows returned. That's pretty much as complicated as the math ever got when I went through school um, because I went through a business systems program. So 
trigonometry was not important in my world. Uh, being able to follow formulas was important. Um, so right here, I'm demonstrating three different aggregates. And what's cool is you can have as many aggregates as you want. in a single command. So this shows you that the minimum total is zero dollars. So it happens to be there's an order line with a zero dollar total. There is a, an order line with $997 as its total. The average is 271 and change, and there's 3,000 rows. So these are the most common aggregates that you will use. MySQL offers about half a dozen more, but they're not that common. Um, Postgres offers uh, an additional 28 aggregate functions. It has aggregate functions for statistics. Like it can figure out the uh, derivatives. It can also calculate uh, the deviance off the mean with a single function call. Um, Microsoft SQL Server offers a lot of those too. Uh, Oracle makes you pay for those features because that's just what Oracle does. Um, nothing against Oracle is just, that's how they make their money. Uh, they charge, they nickel and dime you for, for everything. So honestly, out of the ones I use for my, my day job, these are pretty much the big ones. Uh, there's a few others, odds and ends I've used once in a while, but these are the ones you'd use pretty much all the time. And that is, you know, a basic aggregate function. And you can also give it an alias because you will notice that depending on your database engine you're using, look at the name of the columns. And it's not ideal because when you are working in a programming language, those become your identifiers in the array when you pull back a row of data. Enjoy having a an array whose name is actually a mathematical function. Um, yes, it's easy. You just escape and quote and escape and quote and all that fun stuff. But if instead you could just go and I'm going to get rid of a few of these others just so that I can show this and I go and I run this, you'll see that yeah, we have nice column names now that are probably much more usable by, by the poor sucker programmers having to deal with your queries. Um, yeah, so normally when you work with an aggregate, you will usually give them an alias when they're part of a query so that they're easier to work with. Otherwise, you end up with really weird um, data pieces coming back and it gets kind of challenging, especially if you're working on a language that's not um, overly strict as to what it's allowed to be put in a variable, um, Python and PHP, and uh, potentially JavaScript, uh, if you're passing stuff back to JavaScript directly. Because uh, in PHP, I can take a variable and just execute it as a command. And in theory, if I've got a piece of math in it, it would actually execute the math in the variable that's coming out of the database as a column name. Thus, when you write code, you want to give your functions aliases so you don't have to worry about dealing with that particular wrinkle, let's say. And I already showed you guys all this and count I showed also. Now here is that little wrinkle I said that there's a little something you can do that's a little different. And you will probably need this one for lab eight. I was sitting there thinking of which lab number it was for you guys. Now, here is what's kind of cool. So let's just say I want to go count uh, list. Okay. So if I do count list, it returns 3,000. List, by the way, is the column that has a description of the product. Um, let me just... Uh, show you guys list has the product name in it now let's just say i just want to know how many unique product names there are in the database what i can do is go distinct list 
And when I run this, I have 124. What it's doing is it's going through every row saying, is this, has this been counted yet? No. One. Has this been counted yet? No. Two. Has this been counted yet? Yes. Two. Has this been counted yet? No. Three. So it only grabs the unique values of that column. Um, it is by far one of the niftiest tricks SQL can do for this kind of work. It is insane fast to do this work. I can guarantee that if you were to write a select list from orders and decided to loop through it in Java, your program will run probably 10 times slower. Leverage the power of the database engine to do the work for you. Um, so, like I said, in this case, it counts just the distinct values. Very handy, um, especially if you're trying to calculate, I don't know, wake sizes of an airplane. Um, that's probably a hint for one of the questions in lab eight or nine. It's just putting it out there. Um, or you want to count how many distinct airlines fly out of Pearson. Um, you know, you'd probably want to apply this particular technique. Nifty tricks. Not a complicated trick. It's just you need to be aware that distinct in here, as opposed to distinct out here, is two different behaviors. It, it returns 3,000 because it counted the number of lists. There's 3,000 of them. And there just happens to be a single distinct value being returned because it's only returning one value, so there's only one row, so it's distinct no matter what. When it's between the parentheses, it's counting the distinct values in list. And what's cool, we can actually go, um, okay, let's go um, as a distinct product, comma, let's go count um, cost, let's go distinct cost, and run. Just slap that down here so it's easy to read and go. You will notice that, you know, even though there's 124 products, there's actually 2,553 different prices because the products are not always sold for the same price. <clears throat> American style healthcare, where depending who your insurer is, you pay more or less for your drugs. That was just a jab. Um, but that just shows how you can actually run multiple aggregates that are doing similar things at the same time without them actually doing the exact same thing because they're working on different pieces of data. Yep. No, I just have, when I created this database as a demo database, I forgot to rename the column called list to, I don't know, product. That's on me. That's just, you know, when I did it, I just brain fart, which is fine. I mean, you guys also got to get used to people creating databases that have unexpected column names for things. So never dealt with that ever. Um, and so, yeah, so that's the basics of aggregates. Now we can get a lot fancier with our aggregates. That just shows you the different things you can do. Oh yeah, way fancier. It's about to get fancy. So we can group rows so we can decide to summarize by specific things. And we have a really complex query here and I'll actually break it down piece by piece by doing examples. Um, all right, so before I do the example, here's the information. So when you run a query that has a where clause and a group by. Um, the group by always comes after the where. So like this. So let's just say I want to know Okay, so I'm going to run this for starters just to show you guys what columns I'm working on. 
and I am going to decide I want to add up all the quantities. So I want to know how many of each of these drugs were sold. Now, this is where MySQL is infinitely stupid. It's allowing me to do something that every other database engine on Earth does not allow you to do. It allows me to summarize my data with a display column, in this case, list, without requiring a group by clause. According to this query, Seroquel sold 14,786 units. Wait, if I take that off, it's the same number. Why is it the same number? Because MySQL in its infinite wisdom says, I will trust the programmer that they know what they're doing. And I will grab the very first list value and use that as my summary target. And it'll just add everything in. Every other database engine does not allow this. Therefore, when you work with aggregates and you have a display column, you should always assume that it's going to give you an error, even when MySQL insists on not giving you an error. The proper way to write this, group by list. And I go, go. Now we have useful information. Before this, the data is totally useless. All we knew is how many units were sold total with a random label, which happens to be the very first one it finds. Good job, MySQL. This has been put on the MySQL bug reports for the last 12 years. They have no intentions of ever fixing it. The day they fix it will be a day I'm floored. So here's what it's doing in this case. What the group by does is it summarizes the data by the display column. So if anybody in here has ever done surveys, not as in you're filling out a survey, but on the other side where you're collating the results of your survey, like you're, you're summarizing the results of your survey and Nowadays, people are clever. They use like SurveyMonkey or, you know, one of those nice little services that does it all for you. But those of us that existed before nice services like that were around. And we didn't have the option to use Scantron, which is also great for surveys. We would um, hmm, do it on paper. So we go, okay, question one. There's one, question two, the option was two. And then every single time we go through the next paper, we add up the appropriate columns for the selections the person did. So then we can just add it all up and summarize based on the questions that were used. This is doing the same thing. If I add additional columns, it will break down the summary further for each of the columns. So it'll sub add each one. Um, I'm going to switch away from this one here. I'm going to go select. Um, the count of uh, customer ID, comma, city from customers, group by city. Fantastic. So this is the exact same thing I just wrote. How many people are in each city? Uh, if I wanted to get a slightly fa fancier, and I'm pretty sure my data is actually not going to do very much for this, I can also slap on the region and say, I want you to summarize by region and then by city. And we will have... Um, well, that's kind of cool. It worked. Um, so it's actually going to be the exact same numbers because my data set is so small. But what it would do is it would add up by the region first and then re-break it down again by city. So in theory, you could have the total for each city if this, even though the same city name exists in multiple 
locations, you'd know the total per city in each location. For example, did you know there's an Ottawa in California? So let's say you're just trying to summarize by Ottawa, and then you discover that, whoops, I also have some American Ottawa's in there. Or even better, Perth. A lot of Perths around the world. There's a Perth pretty much in every English-speaking country that's derived from the UK at some point in our history. And there's actually multiple Perths in Canada, just, just so you know. Um, so what this will do is it'll break it down by the first one and then by the second one. If we happen to switch these around, you can. And what we do then is summarize by city. And, the, and like I said before, the numbers will be the same because my data set's only 500 rows long. But it works just to show, you know, how that behaves. Um, so now, that's what group by does. And the best way to learn about group by is to play with it. So add a column, see what it does, add a second column, see how the numbers change, switch them around, see how that changes. So for those of you that want to practice and learn how it works, that's your best way to do it. Is just start playing with our, your group by. Now, the next one after that is the having clause. Having allows you to filter further. Some people are going, well, how does that work? Why would you want to filter further? And that's because we can go You can. That's what I was saying. Yes, I was going to show you later. There's later. So what this is doing is it is summarizing based on the results of the aggregate function. That's the one thing, though. You can't use an aggregate function in the where clause. Like If I wanted to put this here instead and going like this, when I go run, we get an error message. And people are like, well, why would that cause an error? Because we're telling it, hey, I want to count everybody and I want to know only the customers where the count is greater than three. The issue is, is when the where clause is executed, the math hasn't happened yet. The where clause reduces the number of rows being operated on. Then the group by happens. Then you can filter based on the summarized data. And so if I go uh, where, actually, let me just run this really quick. Uh, yeah, let's go like this. Uh, where region is equal to Yukon. And I go run. Now we've got our summary for Yukon. So it literally runs top to bottom or left to right, depending on how you want to look at how the query is written. Because it literally starts from the character one as left, all the way to the semicolon, all the way to the right. So I could write that all as a single line and it would still work. But essentially it runs from top to bottom. So it selects the rows, tells it where you want to grab it. The where reduces the number of rows being operated on, which will of course make your aggregate functions run way faster because they're not working on everything. Then does the group by, so at that point, it's now doing the summarizing of the data that it's going to put in the select. And then it goes having, it's actually going to filter out rows that are undesirable. Um, that last one is not something you use as often as you'd think. Usually these are in reports. So somebody wants to know the top N number of rows, or they want to have uh, exclude any customers that only bought one thing. I want to know people that have placed five orders or six orders or more. Or maybe the opposite. I just want to know the ones that are underrepresented. Therefore, I want to know everybody who's got and actually, I don't have a single one with a region of one or two. Oh, yeah. Damn. 
Yeah, good job. Thanks for catching my uh, issue. There we go. Of course, Yukon. Thanks, whoever said that over there. <laughs> um, totally unprepared for the day, as you can tell. The now, what this is doing is it allows me to just find the ones that are unrepresent or low, you know, low representation. I can do an equal. I can do pretty much any kind of clause you would have in a where clause in here, but it allows you to use the actual aggregate function instead, so you can operate against the math. Um, now, I've actually seen people do this maneuver, and it kind of makes me rage. And that will work. Now, let me explain to you the difference, though, between having it in the where clause and having it in the having clause. When it's in the where clause, it limits it to the region of Yukon, period. And then it does the math. When you have it written like this, and this is very bad form, just because it works, doesn't mean it's a good idea, is it'll actually do the math on the entire table and then just show you the Yukon. So it'll do the math on all 500 rows and then display only the ones that apply. If we were to switch this around and go um, like this, actually, I wonder how many there are in Yukon. Let's go count. Oh, come on, Dan. From customers. So there's 23 customers in Yukon um, total. So if we run this math, yeah, actually it adds up. I was just hoping maybe I had something other than Yukon, <laughs> like maybe another one that was lower than whatever it was, the minimum amount I was going for. Um, but yeah, so that shows you every part of an aggregate function. and. Having count of customer ID greater than three and run. So I just want to bring back and highlight what the different parts do before I move on. So when we do the select, it does the count. And because it sees the aggregate function right here, it's actually putting in a placeholder. So it's going. Right here is going to be the count. We're not going to put it here yet, but this is where it's going to go. And because there's an aggregate function, it also says city and region are placeholders at this point in time. It says, this is what the data is going to look like coming out. We don't know what these values are yet. Then it does from customers. Great. We have a target where we're pulling the data from. Then we have a group by city and region. So at this point, it will operate that entire first section of the query. So. All of this will run. It will summarize all the data, do a nice little bins. It'll go, okay, do we have a is this do we have the city and region already? No, plus one. Do we have the city and region already? You know, plus one as applicable. And it'll just drop them into the appropriate bins. And then it just builds a big giant array, more or less in memory, and adds them up. Do you guys learn about arrays yet in Java? coming up. Okay. Um, so basically it builds a big giant list in memory. Let's go with that phrase instead of an array. And it's just a nicely formatted list that has, you know, account for each combination of city and region, broken down by city and region. Once it's done doing all the math, it then does the having clause, looks at everything that's being returned, and filters out anything that doesn't apply. So it only returns what's being affected. Um, if I were to do an explain on this, which is this, which is a really cool tool. Uh, it's the next icon, two icons over. It's the, this one right here. It shows how it's doing the math. It's figuring it out. So the red box is the table scan. So it's scanning the entire table. 
Then it does the group by, so then it's doing the math. And then it returns the results of the query. And the query block number one is actually the having clause. So it does the full table scan, does the group by, and then query block number one is the having clause, which is cool. Um, when we start doing fancier queries next week, you'll see how complicated these query plans can get. Which one, this one right here? Having? Yeah, so that's saying after it's done doing all the math, now reduce what's being returned to only rows where the count is greater than three. So if I were to take this where clause out so I can show the full effect, you'll see that it only returns things that are three. If I take the having clause out, there's the three, the two, the four. So you can see right here. So you got three, two, four, four, two. If I put that back in, it removes anything three or less. So it, it operates on the results of the aggregate function, not on, um, well, not before it does the math, after it does the math. Okay. Now, here's another uh, nifty trick we can do with this. Actually, let's go see if it's in the slides before I continue. No, I did this. I've done this. Yep. So here's an example of an error message that you'd normally get if you try to do a uh, select statement without without the appropriate group by for a column that's not in an aggregate. That's a sample. Um, here's a slightly more complicated. I already just did this, except for the order by, which is where I was headed. All right. So now we want to know, in order, smallest to biggest. What we can do is we can go order by the count ascending. And now it goes from smallest to biggest. And if I scroll down, you'll see there's, you know, 12 in the Yukon. So if I turn that down into descending, I now have well, just the opposite, right? It, it, it sorted it out, which leads me to the most useful function of the limit command, which I showed you guys limit already. If I just want to know which one has the biggest total without having to do any extra work in insert favorite programming language here, is I do this. It counts the customer. It groups it by the city and the region. The having clause actually is doing absolutely nothing at this point because, but it's still reducing the amount of rows being returned to do the work against. It orders by the, cost, the count in descending order. In other words, biggest one first, limit one. That means it only returns the very first row it finds, which happens to be the biggest total. One single query does it all. Um, in PHP, or most C-like languages, this would be close to 70 lines of code. If you were just gonna retrieve the entire contents of the customer table and manually write the, the for loop to do this, you're looking at 70 plus lines of code. In SQL, it's one. So if you remember two weeks ago when I talked about how SQL is a single purpose language that is very good at what it does, that's an example of what SQL is very good for. Take my word for it. Running a single SQL statement that returns a single value is way better than writing a multi-part loop that builds, you know, that builds up arrays and increments arrays and then sorts the array and then grabs the first that pops the first value off the top to display. I mean, I just gave you a verbal pseudocode of what you needed to do. Trust me, that you know that's more than one line of code in Java. Uh, in PHP, off the top of my head, I could probably do it in about 65 lines of code. Uh, there's, I'm sure there's probably a faster way to do it, but that'd be the, off the top of my head. Or I could do it as a single line. 
So, um, yeah, it's the power of the aggregate function, especially if you ex use every piece of the SQL language to build your aggregate function. It will build you some fantastic queries that run stupidly fast without you having to write tons and tons of code to handle it. Um, I do use this on a regular basis uh, in some of my reports at my day job, where um, often what will happen is they want to know uh, the top 10 customers who did something that day. So I actually have a report that does this, but it limits to 10. And the code just reads those 10 rows and it just opens so the you know, the page loads instantly, even though it might be looking at, you know, hundreds of thousands of rows, million rows. And it just goes, yeah, no problem, bro. Let's do some math. We'll, you know, limit it to this range of dates. We're going to count this. We're going to limit it. And then done. Ten rows back. So I only need to loop through ten items instead of, you know, a million. Uh, way faster. Now, there is two limits uh, with using built-in functions. This one here is just, again, talking about how you need to have a column in the group by. So in any database engine other than MySQL, if you try to have a display column without it being in a group by, it's going to blow up in your face. And uh, the other one, which I also showed you guys, you can't have the aggregate function in the where clause because it has not run yet. You can't filter on math that ma that has not happened yet. Those are two of the big limited functions. There is one other big limitation. And I will show you guys this one right now. Oh, actually, no, let's go back. And we're going to get rid of this. We're going to get rid of this. So, so far we have a pretty well working query, no big issues. But let's say I want to know, and this is one where our brain goes, the human brain says, that shouldn't be hard to do. I want to know the average count of customers by city. I mean, that's actually something that I get asked is, what is what's the average number of orders in any given states in the US for certain sales? So they ran some sales at work, you know, they ran a promo and they wanted to know what the average sale per, you know, region so that they could have conversations with the sales reps is applicable for those regions. And if I try to run this in SQL, it goes, yeah, no. Because you can't run an aggregate on an aggregate because by the time that second aggregate is done, the math has already happened. It's impossible to do math twice at the same time. It's literally saying, I want you to do math on a column that doesn't exist that I haven't calculated yet. It doesn't know how to unnest. So different database engines will give you a different error message here. Uh, the Postgres and Oracle will say a message of uh, cannot use nested uh, nested aggregate function. Because, yeah, that's what this is called. It's an aggregate function inside of an aggregate function, so it's a nested function. You can't do that. So this is a third limitation that the slides don't talk about. Um, there is a way to do that, and I will show you guys that next week. Because it involves a subquery and a, potentially a join, which is, you know, not a topic for today. But there is a way to do it. It's kind of just an extra step. And for the preview of it is you run a query, you figure out the first round of math, you take the results, and you pass it out to the next query. So you're basically running a query on a query to do the math. Um, it's gross. But that is the only way to do an aggregate on an aggregate. But it works. It, this does not. And um, so let's just say we wanted to filter beforehand. So you know how we tried to have our aggregate that read like this? Sum of total, comma, line, 
from order lines group by line. Okay, so we did this earlier, right? And uh, not line, list. So I did this earlier. It's cool. It works. Now, let's just say I also want to know I want to filter out beforehand. So what this slide is showing is, yes, you can't use a sum. So if I can go where sum of total, um, actually, no, let's go sum of price, where the sum of price is greater than, actually, I don't even know what those numbers are going to look like. I'm making this up as I go here. Hang on. Cost, not price. where the sum of cost is greater than 900. No, actually, let's go 1,000. So I've already said that you can't do this, right? It goes, no. If you really absolutely must do this, um, you would actually do some math, like literal math, not the sum. Let's go with... Let's go with um, cost times quantity, comma, total, okay? And I'm going to get rid of this just so that you guys can see I'm doing some pretty basic math for you guys, right? So we've got the, the cost, the total, and the list. <clears throat> what you can do in here is not equal to the total. And actually, it's not going to return anything because my table is actually seen. There's no corrupted data in it. But you could do the math like this if you wanted, where before you might have been using aggregates to filter out the results. Sometimes you need to filter it out a little bit before you do the aggregate. You could actually do the math like this in place instead. It's not great, but you can do math of that nature in your where clause. You can't use the aggregate function, but you can do the math if it's a, a simple aggregate function. And the last topic before we start talking about um, the assignment is uh, one of the useful string functions in MySQL. We have all database servers have it. They just all do it a little different. Is concatenation. You guys learn about concatenation yet in, in Java? String one plus string two equals longer string. Pardon? Sure. Never heard it called that, but sure. Concatenation is, you know, if you take, if you take A, B, C plus X and Z, and you concatenate it, you end up with A, B, C, X, Z, right? At the single string. That's concatenation. String one plus string two equals longer string. You know, you could do string one plus string two plus string three to get an even longer string if you wanted. That's concatenation. You can do the same thing in a database. Um, different, like I said, different engines will do it differently. MySQL has two concat functions, one called concat. Eh, surprise. And the other one's called concat ws, concat with white space. So one will take the strings and glue them together. The other one will glue the strings together with white space between each of the words. Um, and this one shows a whole whack of things. Uh, Artrim, which is, can anybody take a guess what Artrim does? removes all unprintable characters on the right. L trim will remove unprintable characters from the left. Trim removes from both ends. Uh, pretty sure the Java string class, very similar functionality. So what this is doing is it's doing what they call a clean concat. So it's trimming white space from the buyer, 
Then it's trimming white space from the department and it's slapping it all together as a single string, returning it as a nice to read string. Uh, most common use for this is if you need to retrieve people's names out of a database as a single field, and you don't want to take time in or insert preferred language here to concatenate the strings before output. I've done stuff like that when I'm doing mailing lists, for example, where I don't want to get my code to have to worry about what the underlying data looks like. The template says name goes here. Maybe for some applications, it's only last name, first name, business name, could be anything, but we need it to always be called name. Therefore, we grab the first name, trim it, grab the last name, trim it, slap them together, and then you've got a name. And maybe in another database, literally the name is a single field like it is in my sample database I did for this. Okay. So that's the end of this. The aggregate function stuff is a lot of information to take up front, but once you start playing with it, especially when you start going through lab eight, you'll realize that they're really not that complicated. Just take your time. And that's my advice with it is, you know, after you've got one working and it works like you think it's supposed to work, play with it, modify it. First of all, take that answer and put it in your submission. And then play with it before you go to the next question. The way that lab is set up is it, you, anybody here started taking on lab eight yet? Or at least like looked at it? You will notice that the questions build up on each other. And then there's a reset, then it builds up on each other again. So it's basically going, okay, do this concept, now apply this concept to what you just did. Then apply this concept to what you just did. Make sure you understand each of the steps. And aggregates will be a piece of cake for you guys, or at least till lab nine. <laughs> Uh, and for those of you that like to be challenged, <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Okay, now, assignment two. Um, I'm not sure if your lab profs have already talked about assignment two, other than telling you guys, make sure you're in your groups, because it's a group submission again. Uh, it's been published right from the start of the second half of the term, because I forgot to hide it. Uh, <laughs> whatever. At least, you know, those of you guys that were looking at it actually had an idea of what was coming down the pipe. I'll fix the date. So the assignment involves stuff you've been learning since the, since the break. Nothing from before the break except for reading an ERD diagram. That's the only skill from before the break you need. Okay. Now. You will submit four files. And it's this, think of this as submitting a Java program to your prof. You do not submit files that generate errors. Just like if you submit a Java lab and it doesn't compile, what grade do you think your prof is going to give you? Yeah, depending on your prof, somewhere between zero and definitely not a pass. Um, the, when I did teach programming, when somebody submitted a file that didn't compile, that didn't run, I looked at it. I would actually look at their errors and say, this is why you got a zero. Number one, it didn't run. Number two, it didn't run because you forgot a semicolon on line five. Congratulations. Enjoy your zero. It sounds savage. I'm not actually that savage a grader usually, but for that kind of stuff, when I was adamant about it has to run before you give it to me, even if it doesn't run right, at least make sure it runs. Okay. So four files. If you go into the assignment itself, and for me, it's going to look slightly different than you guys, probably. You'll see there's a PNG here. Okay. This PNG it's actually a pretty simple ERD overall. Um, different sections are doing this last second assignment slightly differently, just so you know. Uh, some sections are making you work, use your first assignment as this. So instead of using a diagram that's been created properly, they whatever stuff, whether it was good or bad, is what you'd be using for your second assignment. And if it was a bad design, your second assignment was not going to go well. So I decided to be kind and basically create my own diagram for you guys to make your lives easier. So this diagram, as you can see, is a MySQL workbench diagram. 
Um, what your goal is, is you will submit, like I said, four files. And essentially the point breakdown is as follows. It's 17, 17, 35, and 6. Okay? So there's a lot of points to lose. But there's a but. I always do the math as in you start out with a full grade and I take points away. I don't add from zero go up. I, you, when you submit before I looked at it, you've got a 100%. Then I look at it. I'm not the one grading it, so I don't know if that's how the other profs do it, but that's my approach to this. So go on the assumption that you've got 100% unless you submitted trash. Okay? So file number one is a DDL command file. This is the file that will create the empty database. Also known as lecture from week nine. Yeah, week nine. Create table. Lab six. This is literally lab six. Slightly after it's been going to Popeyes a few too many times. It's just lab six, but bigger. For those that didn't get the joke. <laughs> it's a, you know. So it's got more tables. It's got more relationships. You have to build the relationships. I will show you guys the absolute most important command when I'm done talking about this for this assignment. Um, and I'll explain the, the reasoning behind it. Um, so you will create it. So there is two points for free with your comment block. At the top saying, this is the name of the person that did this work. This is what this file is for. Congratulations, two points. Not zero at that point. You got at least two out of 17. You got 10 points for the table create commands. So what that is, is you're getting 10 points and it's usually depending on who your prof is. I know Doug was a big fan of removing full points. Minus one, minus one, minus one. That was his way of doing it. If I remember it, Adele is more like I, uh, not Adele. Um, LM, I just finished dealing with someone at work called Adele all day. LM. Sorry, Alam, I feel so bad. It started with A and they're four letters. Um, so if if I remember, Alam tends to grade out like I do, where I'll take off points for certain classes of mistakes. So if you make the same mistake over and over and over again, you're not going to lose a ton of points, but we'll only take off so many points for the same mistake. Because obviously you're making the same mistake over and over and over again. There's no point punishing you for the same thing. Then there is five points for actually creating your constraints properly. These are your foreign keys. You don't create your foreign keys, congratulations. You're going to get 12 out of 17. Yeah, just if you want, you know, your full points, you just want to create your constraints. Those are your primary keys and your foreign keys. You will submit as a single file that has all those SQL commands in it. The second one is test data. Again, lab six. Insert, insert, that's what you're doing, insert. However, what's tricky about this one is you do have to take into account parent-child relationships when you're creating your data. So you have to think about looking at the diagram going, which are the tables that don't have parents? Because I probably have to populate those first. So if there's a provinces table, maybe you'll populate provinces before you populate customers because you won't have values for the foreign key. That is the challenge of the second task, is making sure you generate the data in the correct order. And again, you get two points for your comment block. 10 points for functional insert statements. And again, you know, negative one as applicable. Uh, five points for data coverage. In other words, did you populate everything? Did you put data in every table? Believe it or not, this is probably the most time-consuming part of the assignment. Just making sure that you've got it all there. And then people will ask me, well, how many rows should I insert when I was grading this, you know? And people are like, well, how many rows should I put into there? Enough for task three to prove that your queries work, which is what task three is about. So one row is not enough. Two rows is not enough. 
you know, usually I go somewhere between five to 10 is usually a good starting point for an assignment like this, because if there's some questions that have aggregates and you've got one row, like what's the point, right? And again, if you only have one row in each table, you're not proving that your foreign keys are valid because you're going ID1, 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 ID1. Congratulations, all the same ID. Gross. And then you will have part number three, which is you're going to provide 11 queries. You don't need to tell us what the queries do. This is what's cool, because at this point in time, this is where we can start telling whether somebody copied somebody else's assignment or not. Because theoretically, each group's data should be unique. Therefore, if we get one group that submits it, and we get certain values after we run, you run these queries, then another group submits it, and it's the exact same values. I'm going, somebody's cheating. Hmm, I guess some people are, a couple of sets of people are going to be going to visit the chair. Um, so, so far, you have everything you need for one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, seven, eight, and nine. So after two lectures, you have enough to do more than three quarters of section three. So, so far, you guys have everything you need for three quarter, over three quarters of this assignment. You have enough for about 80% of this assignment. So you can start right away and go to town. And once we cover joins and subqueries next week, you will have everything you need to almost finish. Just putting it out there, okay? And then, so the, the way, this one has a lot of points. It's 35 points. And two points for the comment block. No, just two, well, so far six points. But two points for each file with that comment block. You will get three points per query, which is why it's 35 points. You get one point for submitting a query. Congratulations, you actually tried. You get a point if it runs. You get a point if it's right. Because it's possible to write a query that runs, but it not be correct. And this is designed in such a way that it's fair. And I've actually had people submit assignments with like half the queries missing. Like they didn't even get the one point for giving me something. Now, that being said, if you submit 11 select star from customers, which I think is uh, the first query, and you submit 11 of those, you're not going to get the points for the others, right? You, the query submitted has to be applicable to the item being answered. So for question number seven, if you do select star from customers, you're not displaying an aggregate of any, any way. Therefore, it's not valid attempt. So it has to be a valid attempt to get the point for the, hey, you gave me a query. If it ran, congratulations, it runs. And then you got the last one, which is, is it actually doing the right kind of thing? And different people will write queries differently. As you've noticed, there's multiple ways to write the same thing. Therefore, depending on how you decide to handle the question, different groups will have different queries that give similar results. SQL is very flexible. It lets you shoot yourself in the foot really fast. But by the same token, it allows you to actually work with it in whatever way your brain feels most comfortable. It's the way one person would write the query might be completely different than the way another person would write the query, but they might actually give you the exact same results. Uh, yeah. That's your choice. This is, uh, this is dealer's choice. Each group will probably pick different tables. That's what I'm saying, where suddenly if we run these files as a prof and we realize that we have two different groups that gave us the exact same data and they look exactly the same, the, probably both groups are getting reported, right? We're not saying you're, as groups, you're not allowed to help each other out, but you should not be submitting the exact same work, especially with the same data in it. Yeah.
because you've got uh, questions that talk about single table join, multi table join, subquery, and an aggregate that has a join and a group by. So yes, you have to have data in multiple tables to be able to do those things. And we will be checking when we do the inserts. Therefore, if we're saying populate all the tables and you didn't, you're going to lose some points somewhere along the way. And then the last piece, which is not a lot of points, and some people just give up and they go, I'm tired now and I just don't want, I don't care. I'm tired now and I just don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I got to go focus on trying to catch up to that assignment in Java they gave me a week before the end of the term. Done. Right? Um, the last one is actually very small. It's only four points. You get two points for the comment block. So literally 50% if you put your comment block. And then two views. So I haven't discussed views yet. So I'll be talking about creating views in a bit. Uh, depending on how next week's lecture goes, I might actually back load or front load the, the topic of views. So it's happening next week also. So you have everything you need, which is if it all goes well, that's what's going to happen. Um, so you're going to create two views, and they're both dynamic views because MySQL doesn't support materialized views. So I'm getting you guys to create two views, one for query number four, one for query number nine. So in the previous task, there's a query four and a query nine. You're going to create two views named whatever way you want. But they must be there, and they must work. Now, how is this evaluated? Depending on the prof, uh, there'll be a different way of doing it. The way I would normally do it is I grab all four files. I actually have a script that I run because I'm lazy. And as long as you literally call it task one, task two, task three, task four, or I think I called it create whatever, uh, the other profs don't have the script. Some of them just do it by hand. It doesn't take that long. We literally take file one, run it, file two, run it, file three, run it, file four, run it, and look for errors. If there's no errors, it's a good start. Then we look at the results of file three, make sure that there's 11 queries and that they're all distinct. And we kind of try to pay attention to what's in there. Some of us get clever and take a screenshot of the results so that we can compare to other students, right? Um, and that is what you're going to submit is four files. Um, yeah, that's literally it. That's the assignment. There's not a lot of creativity in this assignment. The creativity comes with generating your data, which is not the end of the world. Uh, I will now show you guys two things that are going to make your life easier for this assignment. Item number one. Let's go with... Um, actually, we're going to go drop database because that's the one that works everywhere. I'm going to call it example. Okay, these three lines. In file one, which is your, your um, DDL, you have that as your very first three lines of SQL after your common block. What this will do is it will drop the database if it exists, recreate it, then reconnect you to it. That way, when you run your files one after another, it's always going to work. Because if you are betting that certain IDs are in certain places, depending on how you generate your data, and you're not purging the structure, it's not going to be guaranteed to always be the same between runs. So if you create table one, then you create table two, then you insert some data in table one, table two, then you create table three, and then you insert some more data, and you're doing it piecemeal like that, you may end up in a state that it looks like it all works, but it does not. So Often what's called in for programming, and I don't know about Java for this, but for C and C++ and other compiled languages, we have something called make clean. It's a clean build. So what it does, it deletes all the objects that are normally created as part of the build so that when the next time it's built, it's a complete clean build. This is doing the same thing. It's purging the database right out of the system. And it it's instant. I mean, if I run this file or this command, I go, poop, there it is. 
I just dropped my table called exam, my database called example. And the only thing that's weird about MySQL is it knows that I dropped the database, but it never even detected that I recreated it. That's so if you're not sure if that worked, just refresh your view on the left and you'll see it. So if I wanted to um, continue here as my example, create table sample ID uh, in auto increment. Is that an auto increment like this? No. Nope. Like this. All right. So I do this and I go run. And I'm going to refresh my view and I go, here's my example. Oh, I didn't create the table. Why is that? One auto column must be defined as a key. Oh, okay. Primary key. So at that point I had an error. Great. So I'm going to rerun this whole file again. Boom. Refresh. Example. Here's my table sample. Has just the one column. Now I realize, oh crap. I forgot. I'm also supposed to have name as a var car. Like this. Now I'm going to run, and it's really terribly written SQL, but it'll go. I hit run again. And I hit refresh. And now my example is there again. There's my table. But now I've got my two columns. So what this is doing is it's completely cleaning everything out and rerunning your entire script. Do not have this at the top of every file. Because you'll create your database, then you'll drop it, then you'll try to do inserts, and it'll go blow up in your face. It will be the first three lines of file one of your DDL. Um, so this if exists thing is saying, hey, drop it only if this database already exists. It will make your life easier on the first run. It will also make your profs' lives easier because some of you are going to call this assignment two. Some of you are going to call it green space. Some of you are going to call it ask two. Take your pick. No, I've, I've seen ask two show up so many times. Because they're just putting in as too. That's good. It's short. It's good. They don't think about what it actually reads as. And it's like, okay, great. This allows your environment to always be clean. Okay. Which leads me to how the demo is going to be done. The group's going to come up with a laptop. And this is at least how I did my demos. And I'm pretty sure that's how Alem did his demos. I'm not sure how Wander's going to do it because he's never done this assignment before. So I'm going to be giving him some advice really quick. You're going to come up, put the laptop down in front of the prof. You're going to run file one, run file two, run file three, run file four. You leave. Why? It's proving that one, at least one person in the group knows how to run the files. Two, it's probably your work if it's on your laptop. Don't do like one group try to pull a fast one. I mean, they actually pass each other's laptops. Like at least if you're going to do something stupid like that, don't do it in the same lab section. No, she's laughing, but literally I had a group that had the laptop. They came up, they ran their work. And then I saw two more groups, and then I saw the exact same laptop come up for a different group. And I'm like, and I'm looking at this laptop, and I'm going, if that E key was not missing, you would have gotten away with this because I wouldn't have noticed. At least don't bring up a laptop that's damaged or a unique laptop that nobody else has. Like whoever it is, the lady in here that has a, I think, is it in this group that has a, somebody has a Redmi? No, it's my other group where somebody has a Redmi laptop. Yeah, I wouldn't notice that at all. Okay, so that is item number one to make your life easier is this. So that's the other thing. If you set up your structure like this in file one, it'll make your demo go really fast. I also recommend you try to pick the fastest laptop to do the demo. Because if you're in a group where somebody's got a really shitty laptop and you hit, run and it literally takes a minute to do the inserts your your mileage will vary right okay and item number two is generating your data because some people go oh i don't want to type in 10 rows times 12 tables too much work so there is a very handy website called generatedata.com generate data is slick and it's free. And you can actually uh, check out the GitHub code and actually run it on your local machine if you feel brave. Uh, no, I will not help you get it working. So if you go to the generator and you set up some basic things like this. Nope, it's going. Okay, hang on. 
it remembers the last thing I did when I did this demo last fall. Um, you will see right here where it's got a bunch of different settings and you play with it. It's actually the generatedata.com URL is actually in the assignment. I'm actually saying, you know, it's a good place to use. I use this all the time at my day job when I need to generate test data. I actually have an older version of this site that I hacked so I could do more than 1,000 rows at a time. Hacked as in I changed the value of a variable. Hacked. Uh, I overrode its maximum limits so that I could generate a million rows at a time. Well, I got a load test, right? So when you generate your data, you can do all kinds of nifty things where um, you can pick a name and you got samples of what layout you want to set up the name for. And it'll put it over here as the options, right? So say mail surname, just name and surname. Uh, street address is cool. Uh, I call this one region because, well, it's a region. Different places call it states or provinces or counties or uh, insert whatever the heck your country uses as its designation for a sub, a sub part of the country. District as applicable. Um, what's really cool though is you can actually make it depend on specific regional values. So if you look at the next row down called country, which I'm picking item type country, it's allowing me to use the country plugin here. And I said, I only want stuff from Canada and the US. So what that will do is it only generate regions that apply to Canada and the US. This might seem familiar to the sample data I've been using in class, because guess where how I made that data was this. Um, and then postal code, again, Region number three, it'll actually detect what state or province it is and actually generate an applicable postal code, which is really nifty. Um, now the number range you'll see down here, which uh, you see between one and five, you'll see four, two, three. So what it does, it'll randomly just pick a number between one and five. What use is that for you guys? Hmm, I don't know, foreign key values? Recreate. 10 regions, you know, the 10 provinces or 51 states in the US and you set your range to be one to 51, and it'll randomly assign a state to that person. Or if it's an order status, you have say four order statuses, you know, new, ongoing, completed, refunded, for example, and you could randomly assign values one to four to each order you create by just setting a random value in here. That's how you generate your foreign keys without having to think about it too hard. Now, um, there's a few other nifty ones in here. Uh, for example, there's uh, fake email addresses and you can actually go random domains and suffixes. So it'll actually generate fake email addresses that look real. Um, you can actually go based on the name field so I know that's the name here. Um, so it will actually, gen this is new actually, I wasn't there last time I used this tool. So he's still developing this and adding features. Um, and if let's say I want to include, I don't know, uh, phone number, and I go to North American phone numbers and here's the format for the phone number. I can go um, preview and here's our, Here's our fake email address based on people's names as applicable. Uh, you'll see right here, there's Riley Huber. So Riley Huber at Hotmail with a phone number. It looks real, totally fake, but it looks real, which is so important when you're doing test data. Um, now, some other things you'll need in here is when you set the type, you can pick your different uh, settings. So if you want it to be HTML, or you want it to be, uh, no, no Java. C Sharp, let's go with C Sharp. Uh, nope, no C Sharp for today. Oh, apparently not, okay, let's go PHP. It'll generate an array in PHP for you. So you can see different choices here. So, but what's cool is when you pick SQL, you can pick which database engine it's gonna be against because different databases engines will do things slightly differently. So you wanna make sure you pick MySQL, not MSQL, MySQL, and you'll notice how 
depending on the engine, the queries are changing. You give the table name, otherwise it's not going to gener generate the data for the right table. It's just going to be a pain in the ass to fix. Uh, you don't want to include the drop table. You don't want to include the create table because you, that should already exist. Um, you don't need to have the default auto increment primary key because, well, for the assignment, assume that the column called ID and you'll notice that every primary key is called ID is auto increment. The primary key make it auto increment, okay? And then you can do insert, update, batch sizes, and then when you're done, you close the panel, and then you can go generate, go generate, and it will. If I go download, it'll give you a really ugly file name. Hang on, uh, here we go. It's coming. It's trying. But here's my insert statements for my customers. Done. That took, you know, just a few minutes. Of course, it will won't take you just a few minutes the first time you do it. But this is a really good tool to get comfortable with because it's by far one of the best data generators I've ever used. Um, before I found this site, uh, I was in the middle of researching for before this guy created this site because I literally found him when he was like on version point one. Uh, we were looking at a creating a tool to generate data for testing purposes. And we looked at if anybody had one out there and they were thousands of dollars. And then this guy goes, yeah, this is stupid that people charge for this. Here you go. And he's been working on this for 12 years. It doesn't update very often, but it does update. So like I said, it surprised me that I could now create email addresses based on people's names. I was impressed. New feature. <laughs> so. This will be your friend for task two. Eh? What? Still not catching what you're saying. Oh, a friend for life. I just, brain wasn't catching the life part. Yes, it'll be your friend, period. Um, So, sorry about that. I just, brain was not processing what you were saying. Yes, so it'll definitely be your friend for part two. You will have to learn how to use the tool if you want to do it that way. Some people decide they just don't want to bother to learn how to use the tool and they just hand code the, the insert statements. Either of them is valid. Let's make sure that you're not sharing your insert file, your insert statements with some other group because then your data is going to look all the same and it's going to get a little fishy. Right? Um, all right, so that is it. You guys have almost everything you need to finish assignment two, uh, including, you know, some extra little techniques for making your life easier. And I gave you guys a quick and dirty data generator.com. There's a few other sites that are, that are around. If you Google, you'll find some others. Some of them have some other features that are kind of cool. Uh, there is one called Mockaroo. I think it's called Mockaroo. Um, if it still exists, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but what was cool about it is they generate the parent-child relationships automatically. So you define table one, define table two, and then table two, you'd say, okay, this field's from this row on this table. And then you define table three, so you define all the tables, and it would generate the entire set of insert statements for your entire database. Uh, it was really complicated to use, but it was really cool. I just thought it was just too much work. Like, if I could just use random number or range of values, um, and it, if you play with this, you will also discover it has some really nifty data types. Um, long lat, random number of words. So here's your typical lorem ipsum. So for any of you have ever had to do placeholder text, that's what that's for. Um, you can do alphanumeric, which is nifty. Um, and it gives you a few different choices. You can randomly generate passwords and it gives you a pattern. Uh, you can do postal codes as an example. Um, you can do booleans, auto increment, a number range, which I've shown you guys. Uh, GUIDs, which if you guys don't know what that is, those are glo globally unique identifiers. They're big, long strings that are supposedly unique, no matter what. Um, you can do constants, computed values. Oh, weighted list is new. Uh, colors, URLs, currencies. Yes, they've got financials ones in here. 
currency, bank account, IBAN numbers, uh, credit card, fake credit cards, uh, including fake CVVs. They'll look real. It'll look real. I, I kid you not. Uh, let's go grab, uh, hang on, where is it? Um, here, grab our CVV. And we go um, preview. And we want to make this into uh, HTML just so that it's easy to read. Okay, I'm going to close this. And I go uh, generate, generate. Hang on. It's coming. It's trying. Go download. And I come here and I open this up. Yeah, going here. And here's our, here's our, actually it says phone, but these are our fake credit card numbers with matching CVVs. So you can use this to generate all kinds of test data. Um, for me, it was great when I was testing fake credit cards. Um, we have uh, track information. And for some unknown reason, Chilean rut numbers, whatever those are. If anybody hears from Chile or adjacent to Chile, you know what the hell a Chilean rut number is? I'd really like to know. I have no idea what it is. Um, but yeah, you can I mean you can generate colors and you can actually go, you know, specific, specific shades of blue. And yeah, yeah, you can actually be very specific about this. Uh, actually, go preview this. And what it'll do is it generates. Um, the HTML hex code for your color, which is kind of nifty, you know. So this tool's got all kinds of stuff for you to generate data with. Um, not that some of those aren't very useful for this assignment, but you know, it is handy. So like I said before, if you see a primary key, assume it's auto increment. Yes, you will be graded that your your create tables create the tables exactly as listed here. That means, no, you don't get to be creative with your field names. You don't get to be creative with the table names. It has to be exact, which is, you know, where the creativity does not exist in this assignment. You must be exact to what's on the diagram. Because we will spot check. Like, you know, we do a quick and dirty spot check and make sure that everything's right. All right. So that is it, guys. Um, yes. They are just, um, well, this is a landscaping company, so a service could be mowing lawns. Yes, sir. Visit one, uh, estimate. You just put in whatever you want. Make it up. Make it up. Pretty much. We're not picky. It doesn't have to be real data. Just make it up.